So I have to confess to being your greatest fan girl. I've listened to you for a long time. And I think the thing for me that makes you special is that combination of being clever, but also really genuinely curious. So were you the kind of tiny little boy who was displaying both those things? I mean, were you quite annoying? Were you the guy going? It's definitely you know, annoying. How do pistons work when no, everyone else I was wasn't, saying? No, I Bob do, the builder. I don't. Just a really interesting question. Thank you for being so kind. I, I, te- I mean, teachers and mum and dad always thought I was quite clever, but I don't think the curiosity started until I started my radio phone-in show. Actually, really? yeah. I don't believe that. No, well, because. I, I mean, I was a bit of a dick as a, as a younger man. I was very full of myself and very um, uh, convinced that I was right about everything. And, and parts of me still are. But what I found fascinating, I never wanted to be a phone-in host. It was never even an ambition. I drifted into it by accident. And I started realising that sometimes the people who held the strongest opinions were possessed of the least justification for them. And, and that made me absolutely fascinated into into how that could have happened. And, and from there, you then become curious about everything that strong opinions are held about, not just about the process of how does one form a strong opinion, but, I mean, classic elements of it being, you know, all of the tropes of the genre, the the, the immigration, more latterly Islam, um, feminism, all of these things. I just, I mean, I'm probably going to come a cropper at some point soon, but it has always seemed to me that the more curious you are about how people have got such furious opinions, the more likely they are to turn out not to have anything to build on them. And I like to know how things work as well. Yeah, well, it certainly works on the radio, but can we spool back to what the tiny James was like? Yes. So uh, you are adopted, something that you've spoken openly about before, so I hope I'm not in any sense primed by asking questions about that. No, not at all. At what age did you join your mum and dad? 28 days. 28 days. So I don't have a very capacious memory of, 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 of what was... I never knew any different. Mum and dad were always very clear that we were adopted. There was never a moment where I suddenly discovered it and and, um, I think they got it right. It's interesting how experts change the advice on what you should do with regard to contact with birth families, with regard to what you should tell the child. One always hears stories of people who didn't find out they were adopted until their adoptive parents died and they were going through paper. I mean, there was never anything like that. And and it was only ever a big deal. This is such a credit to my mum, actually, in that it, it it made me even more of a show-off than I was before because I thought, well, I'm specially selected and you're just a biological accident. So, so. <laughs> Did you ever actually say that? <laughs> I, I, I mean, only if, only if someone was a bit ignorant and their ignorance crossed over into rudeness. So you'd always... At prep school, I remember a couple of lads would, would ask when I was going back to the orphanage, but they were asking out of ignorance. But then there was one lad who wasn't doing it out of ignorance. He was doing it out of rudeness. And, um, and Now, you see, that does actually sound quite cruel. Yes. That is the type of thing that I think children might get unbelievably anxious and unsettled by so how come you didn't i don't know and and i'm not i'm still not 100 percent sure that i'm not anxious and unsettled by it I, I, i've got a friend who's a therapist and she doesn't quite believe me when i tell her how secure and how comfortable and how confident i am with it because in her experience I know every therapist never do james <laughs> no, no, they'd sort interest. themselves out of a job wouldn't they it's a very secure well-adjusted <laughs> well person I, I better find something else to do for a living but no, she genuinely believes that everybody adopted carries some sort of uh sense of rejection or sense of um uh, perhaps insecurity and I, I genuinely don't think i do although it, our mutual friend nikki campbell's a, a great um advocate of, of being similarly open about adoption but I think he, he he also struggles to believe that I have no desire to track down my birth family because he of course wrote a book about tracking down his it's been a brilliant experience for him but uh, no I, I just I, I mean just mild curiosity but mm. nothing that you'd describe as visceral. So tell me about home life then the lovely warm I, hearth I, I, yeah, of, this of is the O'Brien I, household. I will get a bit soggy here um, my dad's free. not alive anymore yeah, my dad died a few years ago um but yeah, looking back, 
I was really lucky. I just, I just had such undiluted and unqualified love from mum and from dad that um, I, I didn't realise until I became a parent myself how rare that was and how lucky I had been. So growing up was, uh, I mean, my sister and I fought like cat and dog and um, often still do. Dad was away a lot as a newspaper journalist, and, and I mean a lot. Uh, the miners' strike, for example, we wouldn't see him for weeks on end. But my mum was just... Um, just, just magnificent. I, I mean, I don't want to sound like a like a Wally, but my <laughs> mum was was just love embodied, always was, and I think possibly maybe loved me a bit too much in the sense of fearing that you're not going to have children, which my wife and I went through, sort of thirty years later, um, meant that when she finally did, and I was her first, I, I suspect that I, I may have been indulged. Slightly, okay. but not materially. Yeah. But, but I, I, I was certainly never in any doubt about what a special little boy I was. <laughs> well, maybe we'll come back to that because there is something, isn't there, in being yeah. able to communicate to a huge audience and wanting to do that yes. that is tied in to look, I'm a special Look at me. You know, we call it boy. the look at me gene, yes, actually. Yeah. It's something that's emerged on Unfiltered and you either have it or you don't. And I'm fascinated by people in our business who don't have any of it at all. So I'm not sure I believe them. Yes, well, that's the thing, isn't it? I think there's a lot of <laughs> humble bragging going on about that sometimes. But let's park that for a moment. I'm interested, though, uh, that your family sounds actually uh, quite socialist in its makeup. Yes. But then the choices they made for you education-wise are anything but. So you you went to prep school and mm. then you went to Ample Fourth, which is called yeah. the Catholic Eton. It is, it's yes. mega posh, isn't it? Yes, it is. Public school. It, yeah, full so on public why school. that? Why that I don't choice? Know that the, I think um, Dad was on the Telegraph. Remember, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't on the Morning Star, and they were from middle class backgrounds, certainly um, aspirational. Mum, my, my maternal grandfather, who I never met, was was a proper left winger. He was a trade union activist in a Sheffield Steelworks, but he sent my mum to a private school in Sheffield. So I don't know that they ever saw private education, and I certainly don't either, as being as problematical as many people on the left do. Mum met Nye Bevan in a, in a Sheffield hotel when she was a little girl because her dad wanted her to meet him. So politics, I realised relatively recently, was more linked to our dad's religion, actually. It was more that the schools I went to were always Catholic schools, and we were always taught to be grateful for what we had and to be mindful of those less fortunate. So I never really saw, I used to argue furiously in the debating societies that private education should be abolished immediately. But I also used to argue that abortion should be abolished immediately. You, you, you go on a lot of journeys as a, as a, as a debater <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in an all boys public school. But no, I, I don't know that it was a socialist family. Mum and dad both vote, voted for Margaret Thatcher in 83, I think, the um, the Michael Foot election. Would it but have they been? did, yeah, they did want you, well, you said this, that they wanted you to have a golden ticket. Dad did. I only found this out after he died um, because my dad was a brilliant journalist and didn't, didn't really get the recognition he deserved. And he got made redundant in my last year at Ampleforth, which, again, only relatively recently have I, have I realised what a, what a body blow that was because they'd spent so much money on my education that they could only barely afford. And then that final year, two things happened. I got bloody expelled because I was an idiot. And Dad got made redundant by the Telegraph and put a very brave face on it and carried on working. But he would never quite be punching at that level again, which meant financially, I realise now... Um, mum and dad never quite got back to that level. And that, I realise, is why he sent me to the school that he sent me to, because as, as he rose up through the ranks of regional newspapers and weeklies and evenings, and he moved from Doncaster to Sheffield, started on the Shipley Times just outside Leeds, um, uh, Hull Daily Mail, ended up on Fleet Street, he spent, I realise now, he spent a lot of his career being overtaken by idiots in waistcoats with the right education and that right, easy... Right, because of that network, the because easy confidence. of the Not even the network, or... necessarily. The network plays a part, certainly. Um, it, there's a world where people ask you, when you meet them socially, where you went to school. And that was a world my dad had never been part of. Um, no one ever answers that question. I went to Pudsey <laughs> Secondary Modern or Edgware High School. Do, do, yes. do you see? And, yeah. it, and it's a world in which I was brought up without realising it, and dad very consciously, and mum very consciously 
And, and I, I refuse to apologize for this or even to see anything remotely wrong in it. They, they used their money to give me and my sister the absolute best start in life that they could. And a large motivation for my dad was so that his son didn't get made redundant, uh, 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 you know, at 50 and didn't get overtaken by plummy voiced, less talented journalists and didn't um, ever quite feel that he was properly appreciated, mm. I think. I mean, if you, you won't necessarily enjoy but that. <laughs> do you think that that is some of your motivation for wanting to prick authority, that actually you have carried with you some sense of the yeah. injustice and therefore the I need appreciate, I, I, I had a sense of a bit of a bash? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've got that, and it might be linked to Dad, but I had it before I realised what I've just explained to you. That's quite a recent... Realization: The golden ticket thing is something mum only said. And another thing you say, it's his right, um, because he obviously felt it hadn't been his right. So I was aware of unearned privilege, but I, I, think, I think that was much earlier. I think that was just monks who somehow had this weird combination of religious and secular authority. So not only could they tell you off like a normal teacher or, 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 or do the because I say so line of rhetoric, but also the way we were raised, you felt that they had some sort of divine authority as well. So that, that was a bit of a mess. And I derived enormous pleasure from trying to um, undermine mm. that authority. And some of that was put to incredibly bad use. I mean, do you have bad memories? Never got abused at Ambleforth, but obviously it has been at the heart of the child sex abuse inquiry, one of the first elements of the report to come out. There was casual mental cruelty from some of the monks, but again, I was not vulnerable to that. Some of my classmates were. And no, I, I, I've been staggered to learn about the scale of the sexual abuse. And, and one of my, at the time, one of my favourite teachers um, ended up being convicted of it. He, he never behaved inappropriately towards me, but you look back, obviously, and think, well, hang on, it was that quite as I remember it? And Yeah, which must be very strange. And also to realise that it was prevalent in a place that you uh, were spending so much time in. Mean, you must yeah. have been a boarder there. You yeah, must yeah, have been yeah. there. Yeah, we were know, there all the time. That's why I think that's partly what made us so vulnerable. The, 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 the hardest thing about that for me has been, because prep school was worse fee, actually. My prep school was quite... Um, nasty uh, and you again you didn't realize it at the time because they all were i mean that was it was normal but the headmaster was quite sadistic i think in retrospect and there was two teachers there who are currently in prison um and and we knew at 12 we knew what one of them in particular was doing a, a, a bloke called o'brien oddly enough and I, I i what i've really struggled with since both those stories broke the one at prep school and the one at Ampleforth, is, is if we knew, then the other grown-ups, the grown-ups must have I mean, we knew. And so all the grown-ups I have nothing but fond memories of, uh, th those memories get polluted by the thought that you, if, if we knew, you mm. must have known. And, and it's hard to explain, isn't it? Because it was normalised. There were everyone, even... But, you know, at non-boarding schools, teachers had nicknames. Like, you know, the, the teachers would be nicknamed Pervy or Gropey or the, or the bloke who hung around the PE teacher who was too interested in the showering. And, and we all laughed it off as kids. But actually, it was astonishingly prevalent yeah. and widespread. But it's the, it's the adults who never did anything wrong but must have known that I, I'm still struggling to process. Sure. So presumably you've not made the same choices for your own children. They won't, they won't board. They won't, they won't board. board, but I'm happy for them to go privately. It's just a question of whether we can afford it or not. On your massive media <laughs> salary, On my massive James media salary. But again, it's, it, I, can't, um, I, I can't see anything controversial about looking at the world and looking at your money and choosing to spend it on on giving your children mm. the best available education. I, I mean, politically, I'd like that education to be available to everybody, but I don't think anything served by denying it to... If my dad had denied it to me, um, it wouldn't have meant that the kid down the road who could never have afforded to go to Ampleforth would have had a better education as a result. So mm. I, don't, I don't quite... It's an interesting it. one, isn't it? Because it is one of those things that uh, gets thrown at people in the public eye mm. if they put themselves in the position that you're in of advocating and overseeing arguments that are often about privilege... Yes. about the haves and the have-nots. And I wonder, since you've had your own family, how does that play out when you're on air and someone throws a barb at you for your choices just because you're doing the job that you're doing? They're, they're, they're often bollocks, 
I, I mean, that's the easiest <laughs> defence. Do you say that? No, I, no, I can't say that. That's why I, I do enjoy podcasts. <laughs> but, the, I mean, the idea that I, I my my views on foreign people are, are, are skewed by the fact that I live in in Chiswick and why don't you move to Tower Hamlets now? I mean, you do wonder sometimes whether these people have ever been to London. You can't walk up Chiswick High Road without hearing 10 or 12 different accents. And it's, it's, a, it's a mark of your personality, whether you react like a normal human being or you react like Nigel Farage and come out in the rash about the fact that people are speaking foreign, even though you're German wife is at home with your half German children. So I can deal with that. How dare you live in Chiswick? I mean, that that's fine. I've never advocated against private education, so that's never really come up. But it, it is the kind of thing that the male or the son would go, oh, yeah, this lefty. Um, but I'm not a particularly left-wing individual. I'm happy to see profits being made by companies. I just think the gap between the people who are making loads and loads and loads and the people who are making next to nothing in the course of the last 20 years has become intolerable mm. and, and I think we should all work to close it a bit. Do you like the term uh, liberal poster boy? Uh, I, I can think of worse terms. <laughs> <laughs> but it identifies you, doesn't it, immediately as having, you know, some kind of a political spin on you. I, it's more about the people I've argued with and, I mean, the, the, the things that have got, everything's changed for me since the clips of the radio show started going viral. And and you're very kind to have said that you've enjoyed the show for years, but before that started happening... Yeah, it was just me, James. It was just you, Fee. There was no one else, you and my mum. <laughs> and she could only get me after we went national because <laughs> LBC didn't reach Kidderminster. It really was just me. <laughs> so I, I think there were 200,000 weekly listeners when I started, and there's over a million now. So obviously the transformation has been immense. But it was, it, it was really frustrating, actually, about five or six years ago, because I thought I was doing really good work. And I, and I didn't quite understand why it wasn't cutting through. And, and I, I reached a place where I was relaxed about that, and I love my job, and if I'd never achieved the next level of, of recognition or renown, I would have been cool with it. I wasn't for a while, but I'd reached a place where I would have been. And, of course, as soon as you're comfortable with the level that you're on and you've stopped fretting about getting on to the next level, then, of course, it happens. That's, mm. that's sod's law. But, but the clips went viral, and... Some of them were monologues, but most of them were me arguing. A lot of them were me arguing with people. And my position, I think possibly, has been defined as much by the opposite of the people I was arguing with as it has by anything that I've personally professed. So, so yeah, I believe in redistribution of wealth up to a point. I think the NHS um, is in danger of being lost if we don't appreciate how important it is. I'm incredibly sentimental stroke supportive about public sector workers specifically especially in the in the emergency services but i don't know what they mean when they say lefty and liberal anymore it was in the mail yesterday peter mckay who's, who's obsessed with the fact that i used to work in a shop and thinks that i'm embarrassed about the fact that i used to work in a shop it's lbc's pet lefty and I, well, what does that actually mean hmm. it just it just it just means that i think we should all be nice to each other and that's that's not that shouldn't be controversial shouldn't be left -wing. even in the day well, not, not the preserve of the but left no, wing, no. exactly that. Uh, let's talk about the shop so yes. you Leave ample forth. Just for the record, what were you expelled for? Cannabis. Okay. Mm. Uh, did that ever go to the police? Yes. It did? Oh, the, sh okay. the full shebang. My two best friends um, ended up in court. Uh, 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 there were four of us that were expelled, and they split between those who could have been... Well, m me and... We were four best mates. Me and Adam didn't end up in court because Paddy and Arthur were the ones that, that were accused of supplying rather than merely using. And, and by supply, they just meant that that we'd, they'd go into York at the weekend, buy a bunch of hash off a bloke in a pub and um, and then bring it back to school and divvy it up and everyone would chip in. But, of course, once Humberside Drug Squad turned up, that becomes dealing. So they ended up in court where they got a character reference from Cardinal Basil Hume, who'd never <laughs> met them, but because he was linked to the school, so it must be fine. Okay. Outstanding boys. And the judge asked Paddy, how, what sort of quantities... Are we talking about? And this was not Miami Vice. Pat Paddy said, well, sometimes it's about the size of a Mars bar, but most of the time about the size of a fun-sized Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> the international The internationally recognised measure of, 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 of hashish. OK, uh, we shouldn't laugh about it. Condition, Let's... well, we can laugh now. Conditional discharges they got. Yeah. So they, it all ended OK. Uh, what does Paddy do now? I'm not sure. OK. I, 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 Did we, life we... not work out for no, Paddy? No, Paddy's fine. Um, one of the other lads, I think, fell off the radar a bit. And I'm still friends with, with, with Adam, with, with, with another one. Um, I, I think Paddy went to work on the family farm, actually. It's, um, it was a big, big, big... At the time, horror, because I really felt I'd let down my mum and dad. And, and I spent the next year or two 
trying to just be a good son, get mm. my A-levels. Was get, your dad very disappointed? Absolutely furious and heartbroken. Given what I've just said to you about how much it meant for me to go there. I think mum was more socially embarrassed. She didn't like the idea of having to tell people in Waitrose what had, what had it happened. It could be very difficult. But, uh, and at the time, it seemed like the end of the world, but now it's, it genuinely is, apart until you just asked about how my parents felt, it's something I can gloss over and laugh about and describe it as character forming. Mm. But it was, it was a big, huge, it was on the news and everything. It was in yeah. the papers. I mean, it was... It was pretty hardcore, actually, yeah. at the time. So you went to the LSE, yes. and then we find you after... a after... year in Manchester. OK, which, which was, didn't work out. No, which was really important. Oh. I did Manchester Youth Theatre when I was 16 in 1988, and that changed my life, um, which sounds a bit severe. But think about the environment I was in. It was a, a, quite, quite a chippy young lad in an incredibly privileged environment, very conscious of how lucky I was to be having this education and, and living this life. Um, and I always loved acting. And I did Manchester Youth Theatre, which was a proper old-fashioned community youth theatre linked to the National Youth Theatre, really hard to get into. I went for an audition at the National Youth Theatre. I got in, which was, you know, announced at assembly-type achievement. And the bloke who auditioned me ran the Ma Manchester Youth Theatre, 16 years old, stayed with my godmother in Stockport. And for the first time since I was three, because I went to my first school was private as well, the convent in Kidderminster, I just knocked about with people who were from completely different backgrounds from my own. And and it was revelatory. I genuinely revelatory. And I'm still friends with people from, probably still in touch with more people from Manchester Youth Theatre than I am with people from school, if you don't include Facebook and Let's in not, terms yeah. of people I see and, and hang out with. But revelatory because you had a sense that you had found your own people? Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I found my tribe, actors. Well, not just actors, but, you know, one, one of them now runs a theatre company for children with Down syndrome and other learning disabilities. Um, uh, they, 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 they were I just made some really, really good friends, and it had nothing to do with the context of, of making friends at school. So I did it three times. I went back for three summers. At the end of the third summer, after I'd been chucked out of school, I moved there just to live in a house with some of the other people from the youth theatre. We put on plays and we faffed about, and I knew I was going to LSE at the end of that year. And that, that was, that was all my mates from school were in Goa and Laos. Mm. And I was in Chalton Cum Hardy, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. Really so wouldn't. was there something of, uh, you know, the turning your back on, uh, I don't know what it would have been. I mean, just privilege or I because... I don't think it was turning my back on it. I think it was just recognising that... Um, it was just having really good fun with people who who, who were like very, minded. Yes, yeah. very similar to me. So my best friends from school would have been the ones that were involved in the acting side of things. And my favourite teacher was the woman that ran the drama department. But at school, it was a rugby school. Um, it was it, it it was fringe. It was a fringe activity. All of that. And when I won a big public speaking competition. Um, and nobody noticed. Whereas when someone got a trial for the England rugby team, the whole, the whole world would stop. And I, I, I harboured a vague sense of, of resentment about this, thinking that these skills matter too. And, and then I went there and everyone was a little bit like me. They're completely different backgrounds and levels of intelligence and, and, and engagement. And so, but just it was just really nice to hang mm -hmm. out with people who weren't obsessed with status and rugby. Yep. So, LSE, yes. university years, yes. and then we find you working in Aquascutum yes. off Regent Street, uh, the job that now people are There's assuming. Daily that, Mail know, columnists are yeah, obsessed. You'd, you'd like three to time. hide away. Yeah. But you don't hide it away at all. I've I mean, I've, it. Yeah, I've seen it mentioned all over the yes. place. Were you, were you good at it? Yes. I mean, can you size up a man's I, inner I, leg I, measurement at 20 I, paces? I, I, yes, I probably can. It was my job when I was at college. It was my Saturday job and my summer holiday job. And then... Journalism proved in, inexplicably resistant to my talents and charms. So How could it that be? became my job after university for two or three years. I have to get a calendar out and work it out sometimes. But I loved it. I really liked it. And, and I, I, I still got a little bit of me that wouldn't mind opening up a little. Um, one of my old colleagues from them has got a place in the city and he's doing absolutely top dollar bespoke tailoring. And, and, it's a little bit of me that wouldn't mind going and do a week's work experience with him because there's something I don't know what it is. I, my mum had a little frock shop in Kidderminster, so she she had a dress agency when we were growing up with her best friend Annabelle, and and they would put on fashion shows, 
and and sell the dresses at the end of it. And so I don't know, the rag trade, I don't quite know how it happened, but I, I loved it. And I, and I loved the class element of it as well, because it was really posh aquascutum. You'd get MPs coming in and, and lords and, and various other mm. uh, sort of celebrities. And that's what then made the leap into journalism a possibility because John Major yeah. ordered a a white suit for this a do in Strasbourg. The, the, well, Dad had been made redundant about five years previously. So I, I, again, utterly unapologetically hoped he might be able to pull some strings for me or call in some favours. But most of his generation, this is, you know, the, the, that mid-90s by now when Fleet Street was undergoing seismic changes and most of his generation had either moved along moved on or passed away and and there weren't i mean he I went to see charles moore who was editor of the sunday telegraph had been seconded to my dad when he joined the telegraph as a cub reporter so he followed my dad around for a while and used to ring dad up a lot subsequently for for, for advice and to say how shall i do this um and then Charles Moore came to talk to the Catholic Society at Ambleforth, which I hadn't attended before or, or since. But I thought, I'll go along and I'll tap him up for some work experience. And he said, you, you know, you can have a fortnight in your summer holidays. And I thought, that's it, I'm in. And so I turned up for my fortnight's work experience. So I was just about poised to ask where my parking space was. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I was with a bunch of kids who were still at Eton where Charles had gone, and, and I was just seen in that. So it was literally just two weeks' work experience looking through the window. I got a byline, tried to get ahead, didn't happen. Went back to the shop and, and carried on measuring inside legs. I was three months away from an interview to be an area manager to move out of the shop on Regent Street and take control of some concessions outside, you know, like Selfridges has a department. Mm. or um, When all the major tailors were off sick, a proper lurgy in a department store like Aquascooter. If it spreads, it can be really like a school. And there was an appointment at Downing Street to fit John Major out for a white suit, for a suit. And so we went along, did, did the fitting and the kitting, and he, and he looked through the cloths and said, I quite like the look of this, and ordered a white one. And, <laughs> and, and even with my, I've got appalling news sense. I didn't realize that at the time. I thought I was going to be Woodward and Bernstein. But I didn't know a story when it landed on my head sometimes. But because the spitting image was portraying him at the time as grey with his underpants outside his trousers, I knew that had some legs. So I rang the William Hickey column at the Express. I had a friend from school who worked there. He was a top lad, but he didn't. He wanted the story and he wanted to pay me for it. And I, I wanted to use this as a way to get into the... Building, so I asked to speak to his boss, and, and, and they offered—I think they offered five hundred quid. It was a good tale, that. and I said, "Can I have a couple of shifts instead?" And that was it. And once I got those shifts, and I wasn't a great gossip columnist, but once once I got through the door, um, I carried on for about a year, still doing Saturdays in the shop mm. and doing other shifts as well on other diaries, like Londoner's Diary on the Standard and Peterborough at the Telegraph, Mandrake at the Sunday Telegraph. Um, but that proves Dad right, doesn't it? Because I, I was walking the walk, and it's quite a patrician world, the world of the diaries. And I, a couple of occasions where I caught my accent. I remember put the phone down once on the Marcus of Bath, and I had Pete Tong to ring next, the superstar DJ. Oh, what a day. And, 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 and there was a, a, a Charlotte Edwards, I think it was, who's now a brilliant journalist on the Evening Standard, but she was like me in quite early days. She commented that I'd, I'd gone from going, Alex, oh, it's splendid, thank you, yes, of course. We'll put a few words in tomorrow's favourite. Oh, pip, pip, OK, yeah, well, put the phone down. Pete, so Brian on the Express, mate, what are we going to do about the football on Saturday? And so it was a bit of a yes. wally. In the book. Yeah, but actually isn't being uh, on a diary column, isn't it a, the slightly slimy edge of journalism? I mean, aren't you... You're trying to get people to say things they'll regret. Yes, and you're also, you're wanting to raise eyebrows all the time, aren't you? Ooh, look at her. Ooh, look I, at her. I never saw it like that. I mean, in the first instance, I saw it as the only door that was open for me to get through. I, I wanted to be a literary critic or a theatre critic. There's, there's no training scheme for that. Or, um, and... And I, never, I didn't do the really nasty stuff. I mean, the second or third shift there, the editor of the page asked me to phone Susan Crossland, who is the widow of Anthony Crossland, a um, politician, because a new book had been published which revealed that Tony Crossland had had a gay affair at Cambridge in the 30s. And, and this fellow just leaned across, could you, could you give Susan Crossland a ring, ask her if she knows about this? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, could you give, give her a ring? And, I'll, and so I, I kind of... Um, I phoned the speaking clock a few times. So, okay, no, that's absolutely fine. She's not in. She's, <laughs> she's, and then eventually I, I, I got through to her and, and 
I was I was rubbish at this sort of mm. stuff. And well, I heard you talking to Alan Rusbridger oh, in yes. an earlier edition of Unfiltered mm. about that, and I rather loved the way that both of you, who let's face it, have done extremely well in journalism, uh, admitted to just not being very good reporters. Yeah. Actually, not having the slight. I mean, it does verge on. It's definitely sociopathic or even psychopathic to want to invade somebody else's world yes so much to tell lots of people who they don't know i mean that is an it, it odd, is odd to see thing to do uh, i mean that, so you lack the the yeah. kind of killer claw for that also the talent i mean you know it, it wasn't i'd love to chalk it up as evidence of me being too nice for the for the business but i couldn't have been my dad either my dad's te- i mean he, he didn't have a sociopathic bone in his body but his ten t- his industrial correspondent he'd write about business and he, he'd want we have arthur Scargill ringing the house and, and then Rob, Robert McGregor was it the head of the coal board so we'd have both of them whispering and that's why the Telegraph is impossible to believe now but the Telegraph used to be an astonishing newspaper so I didn't have that I, did, I wasn't good enough and possibly lazy is not quite the right word and then I didn't have the thing I encountered when I got on the Express that you describe which was the um, I mean it's a callous disregard for people's feelings and, and I, I'd be so when I got through to Susan Crosland, I, I, I probably spent five minutes saying sorry before I, I, I have to ask you this. But I, I just wondered if... And what did she say? What oh, you answer? poor, poor boy. Who put you up to this? Of course I knew about it. And then five minutes after that, the editor of The Express, who I'd never met before because it was much more... Ella came over and said, who's just phoned my friend Susan Crossland to ask her about... And I thought, oh, my God, it's, <laughs> I've been here three days. I'm going to be back on the, back the suits. Get me back on Mesbert But you again. don't fight shy of taking people down. If they deserve it. Now. Well, you you say that, and, and we'll talk about the politicians, yeah. um, you know, later on. But actually, you are you do a pretty fine job of the man on the street if you think that the man on the street is stupid and not backed up by enough They're facts. two very different things, aren't they? Well, you tell me. Well, no. I, I think if people are, are, are genuinely slow of thinking then there's a requirement to be gentle and generous, which I've only come to latterly. I, I could, I mean, it's fun. It's a spectator sport to duff up a bozo. And I've done that, certainly. But but since Brexit, when it all started getting a bit nuts for me, it's the confidence I go after. It's, it's I mean, the, the assistant producers, you, you know how it works. There's no point putting someone on who's not really, really confident because it's really bad radio. So the only people I really go for are the ones who who think they think they know better than me, and the, the the relish that perhaps I have in proving that they don't is is built more upon their confidence than mine. So I'm not. It's not just public figures that deserve it. We've we've voted to do something that I consider to be catastrophically mm. stupid, and I want every single person that did it to either take responsibility for what they've done or recognise that they were horribly manipulated and misled by some deeply, deeply unpleasant individuals and vested interests. And, and I, yeah. But have you had to kind of steel yourself to do that? How do then? you mean? Well, there is an element in your broadcasting which makes you unswitch offable because... As the listener, I know it's adversarial and somebody's going to win and it's yeah. probably going to be you. And I think that you do have to steel yourself yeah. to be that person. I don't think you can just go into it with the nice, pro- probably Mrs. Crossland attitude of, oh, you poor thing, yeah. you know, you're, I, I, you're not I, very well informed. You know, I'd really like to help you. That's not your shtick at all. No, now. it's not. I think I just am that person. Actually, and my sister would agree, I, I, and, and so would the lads from school. I, I could start an argument in an empty room. I don't know why, <laughs> but but as I've got older, it's been more important to me to be right. Yeah, to to have the tools to back up what I believe, and 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 I've been wrong about some things. Abortion, I mean, Christ, to be the biggest example. I was an insufferable sort of fifteen year old public school Catholic debater on that, and and, and completely completely wrong. Against it? Yeah. Against a woman's yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what changed your mind? Uh, I thought I'd got someone pregnant when I was 16. It turns out I hadn't, as, as we discovered many, many years later when my wife and I struggled to have children. Um, but that suddenly, it was all about her. It had nothing to do with my beliefs or my religion. It was entirely to do with what she wanted and what she wanted to choose to do. And it was, I mean, it wasn't even profound. It was just like, oh, yeah, you got that wrong, you, you twerp. Um, I wonder what else. Yeah, first person experience is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Isn't it yeah. just? Yeah. So when you first sat down in the LBC studio, mm. uh, how what what level of 
of adrenaline do you think was coursing through your veins? Did it immediately feel, as it does for lots of successful broadcasters, I'm home, this is it, I can do it? it a little bit. I'd had that earlier, actually, when, when I used to, and in fact, this is when I first met you as well. I went in to do paper reviews because I ended up somehow as show business editor of the Daily Express, which still makes very little sense in retrospect. Probably made even less sense at the time. Um, I'd go in with Derek Hatton on talk, sport or talk radio or whatever it was called Kelvin yeah. McKenzie's outfit and and me and Carol Sala who's a great newspaper columnist would do the papers and she rang in to the LBC show the other day and said I knew even then when we were doing the paper reviews that this was where you were going to end up but I didn't and then I'd go in to Five Live where, where you were working and, and a couple of other people and I'd do review the papers with Brian Hayes or or, 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 or someone like that and I, I do remember thinking oh it's lovely, isn't I, I, it? This is, this is, and, 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 and my liver was shriveling at the time on newspapers. I was, you know, I wasn't very good at it. And you become the person that you have to be to survive. So I'd be having big fights in the newsroom with a news editor and shouting at people across the end of an era. Um, uh, but, but I bought into it because that was the only way I think I was going to get through it. If I, if I sat there and recognised how rubbish I was at bringing in scoops, then... I'd have folded, but so I had to push back and pretend that my half-fast story was actually better than it really was. And and I just, I just by the time it was TV first, actually, we did the right stuff on Channel 5 in Manchester, in uh, Norwich. And, and I just thought, yeah, I'm better at this. I'm actually quite good at this. I love talking. I love listening to people and, uh, and I love arguing. So mm. we did the right stuff for a while. That hit the buffers. Fell in by accident to some holiday cover at LBC. And yeah, did pretty quickly think, gosh, they pay you to do this. Mm. And were you doing the full three-hour stint right no, from the No, I did holiday going? cover. I, 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 I was doing... Um, I had a year of struggling after after I left the right stuff or after the right stuff left me. The immediate thought was to go back to newspapers. But my wife, I was married by now, and Lucy said, you you are really good at this. Because I've got a curious mixture of arrogance and insecurity like a lot of people in our, in our line of work. I kind of recognise that I'm quite good, but I have moments of thinking I'm absolutely rubbish, of imposter syndrome. But Lucy said, quite diplomatically, what she was really saying, of course, is you, you really were lucky to get so far in newspaper. <laughs> Where, I think yes. that. And so, darling, you need a job. So she said, give yourself a year. Don't go back to papers yet, because you'll go in lower than you left. You won't go back in as a show business editor, so you'll have to do a little bit of humble pie or whatever. She said, give yourself a year. So I gave myself a year, which meant I, I had a year just doing the the talking head gigs, not not presenting, but being a contributor. And it that's not a way, that's not a living. I mean, the money was all right, actually, and we didn't have children at the time, and Lucy was working at, for, I think, at the Mail on Sunday, or she was possibly still on the Express. So, you know, we were fine. But at the end of that, I had a tax bill due, and I had no permanent work, and LBC was in the basement of ITN on Grays Inn Road, and I was doing a... A, a, a staged argument on the Channel 5 News when Kirsty Young used to perch on the edge of the desk. Oh, she perched very she well, perched, didn't perfectly she? Perfectly perched. Yep. And they did a... They were quite ahead of their time, actually. They they had two talking heads on every night to argue about the news in the second half of the news after Kirsty had done the actual news. Then me and someone like David Meller would have an argument about... Oof, that's not something you want to do for the rest of your life, is it? So, so amazingly, <laughs> it was David Meller, funnily enough, who didn't turn up one time and they drafted in the emergency which was a lovely woman called Sandy War who worked for LBC and she we got on very well and we were having a chat in the commercial break and she said have you ever done any radio and I said well no not really she goes well my, I'm, I'm going on holiday next week and my holiday covers just just let us down why don't you give Rob Hooker a ring the the program controller and I, and I thought cruel hmm, tax bill um, yeah why not yeah all right I will and I think that's the only this I've only put my hand up for work twice in my career. I've only asked for work twice. One was that time when I phoned up Rob Hooker and he'd seen me on the right stuff and liked me. And so he said, yeah, come in and we'll show you what to do. And then the second time was many, many years later when I got in touch with the editor of Newsnight. But, um, but it worked. And then Chrysalis bought LBC just as I was learning the craft, doing lots of different holiday cover, thinking, crikey, we might be all right. We might be all right. I might make a career out of this. And then they announced... Oh, man, I haven't thought about this for years. They announced the um, the roster of presenters. Do you remember? 
when they were bringing over all sorts of people, like Sandy Toxford came over to do a show, and they yeah, she did they, the they must have spoken show. to you as well at the time. I, I imagine, comment. of course not, but they were hiring really well known people, <laughs> and there was me who was not known at all, but who was I thought getting the hang of it rather quickly, and they announced the breakfast show, which I could probably list them. Everyone actually, it was Jane Moore and John Nicholson, Nick who's still there now, of course, Nick Ferrari, doing mid-morning. So they were taking some people with them from the old regime. But I wasn't part of the old regime. I was holiday cover for the old regime. Sandy Tox who came in to do a lunchtime show. They brought Frank Partridge over from Sky, Caroline Faraday over from Five Live. And they just kept announcing the roster. <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't on it anywhere. And I, I tried to have chats. And it was back to phoning Susan Croston, going up to the bosses, going, excuse me, hi. <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't happening. And I, and, and I can say this now because we've had a rapprochement in recent weeks on social media. But Matthew Wright and I had fallen out quite badly. I felt I'd been very shabbily treated when the Channel 5 gig ended. And he ca he carried on with a, with a different format, which wasn't necessarily what we'd agreed when I left newspapers and moved to Norwich to make a television <laughs> program. So and then I had this wonderful Australian producer called Tiffany Lippitt. Um, and she knew everything. Did you just do an Australian accent T there? T it was just, just her name lends itself. I just, that's what I used to call her. I haven't seen her for years. She's back in Oz. And I came in one afternoon to do the drive time show because I was doing everyone's holiday cover by now. So I was doing Steve Allen's mid mid morning, every time there was a slot up, Rob would give it to me, which was great, but they weren't announcing it. And people but were there leaving was one by week now. in August where it was just James O'Brien. Uh, yes, all the way Simon through. Bates left because, you know, he, he, he was too big and, and, and too well established to wait around for, uh, for, 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 for the right noises or to see how the land lay with the new owner. So people were leaving, people were being fired, and I was just filling every gap I could without being given a permanent berth. I was beginning to get quite panicky. And I came in one day and Tiffany looked at me and she, she just went, you better have a word. And so we went out of the studio and, and she said, um, they've just they've just given Matthew Wright that Saturday morning <laughs> slot that you had your eye on. Oh, dear. And I was like, you are... I thought she was joking. And I could tell from her face that she wasn't. And, and so that, as far as I was aware, that was the last slot gone. And I was doing Channel 5 News again the next night. And, and the programme controller rang up and said, I'm so sorry not to have spoken to you. And I thought, oh, I think I, he's not going to just be ringing up to say, sorry, we haven't given you a job. He, he, so they offered me 10 o'clock Sunday nights in the new, in the new lineup. And do you know what I did? I haggled over money. I've never done that in my life, but I was just sort of so... So they said, we'll give you X hundred pounds. And I said, well, I, I, I think I deserve X hundred and fifty. And then I got an extra 50 quid out. And you could hear in his voice, he's going, yeah, well, all right, OK. <laughs> so that was it. And I did that. And that, yeah. that, that was... Yeah, um, and greatness was born. Let's not be silly yeah, about it, but, but I born. haven't left. Actually. Can I just ask you about your wife, Lucy? Mm. Is she very much the power behind the throne? I mean, you're both journalists. Yes. I presume there was, you know, there were times when, you know, she might have been, as you said, doing, you know, very well or yes. more secure or better than you. How does it how does it work um, between you? I think for, for mothers, you when you leave for a bit it's almost impossible to get back to where you deserve it's almost and, and she was very surprised when our daughter came along that she wanted to be at home more I don't think she'd ever envisioned being that person but she did and we were luckily in a position where she could be but um but I think I mentioned at the outset about being a bit of a dick I think I think I was a bit of a dick then as well when I thought she was somehow lucky I had to go out to work every day and she could stay at home and look after the children. That wasn't the case at all. I, I think it's a really, really tough country and business for very, very talented women who choose to to have families and be with their families for the formative years to, 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 to get back in. So she's done brilliantly. She's written cookbooks. She does extremely high-level media training of, of kind of household name chief execs that I get told off if I mention because they don't want anyone to know they're getting media training. <laughs> okay. and, and, she, and, and she does various other... Um, various other things, but she would have been a. Her and my dad got on like a house on fire because they were both hardcore news news journalists, and she could have, she could have done anything she wanted to do, but um, but she didn't because because she she wanted to be with the kids, and that doesn't make her lucky. Hmm. Do you call? Are you one of those modern men who calls themselves a feminist? Are you a feminist? I, I am, yeah, I, and and I I would have sneered. Or, or, or pulled a slightly self-conscious face a few years ago, but I've been thinking about this more than almost any other subject recently. And um, Me Too has really focused the mind on it. Um, and I, 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 I also like 
as you established at the very outset, I, I am really curious. So I like to find new ways of looking at the world and realizing that my old way of looking at the world was wrong. So this word patriarchy or the word objectification, which I would previously have been probably because of the tabloid newspaper background, maybe, or the all boys school. Um, we were in Edinburgh last month and Lucy pointed out, or one of my daughters actually pointed out how few statues of women. And that there would once have been a part of me that would have gone, well, that's because men have achieved a lot more. There's a lot more men have achieved a lot more. And I wouldn't have known I was being a knob. I wouldn't have known that was a silly thing to say. So, yeah, feminism in, in terms of recognising that it is a hell of a lot easier to be a man in our society than it is to be a woman for a whole heap of reasons. In fact, I think the people, and it's a long list and a crowded field, but the people I find most ridiculous in the public discourse at the moment are these people that think that straight white men are a, are a victimised group who, who need champions and need need more support in the public space. Mm. I think that's hilarious. Yes. OK, that could go in your Thursday mystery hour. <laughs> There's a lot week. of them and they're growing. I mean, these men's right movements and, well, the, the, I mean, there's nothing funny about that terrorist who, who described himself as an incel, an involuntary yes. celibate, and they're, they're, they're sort of champions of, close to the alt-right, isn't it? The men's rights and the alt-right seem to... I, I just find them, I mean, terrifying, but, but hilarious yeah. and terrifying. I mean, I think the notion that society has denied you <laughs> sex that you're entitled to is definitely something that needs taking apart and then taking down. Yeah, James, but you actually. know, I... I the, the, Re relatively recently, and again, this is why I, I use the word feminist with a completely straight face now. I didn't realise until I was writing about it quite recently. In my lifetime, it was not illegal to, you couldn't rape your wife. In my lifetime, the statute book didn't have, didn't mm. accept the concept of marital rape. So I knew that, for example, you could be criminalised for being gay in relatively recent memory. But I had no idea that when I was alive, my mum wouldn't have been able to get a mortgage unless she had a guarantee from her dad or her husband. She wouldn't have had a chequebook until 1967. Bingo. And yes. even after 1967, if you wanted to get credit in a shop, even until 1977, a lot of shops would quietly operate, a, 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 well, could you get your husband to sign it? type yeah. policy. And I had no idea about that. So what I just thought was normal, I realise now as a feminist, are wins and victories and what you have won, you can lose again. And some of the tides that are moving in the world at the moment, as you've just mentioned, with regard to this ludicrous notion of involuntary celibacy, or what, what's the other one they use? The, oh, oh, I can't remember. But the, the, the phrase that essentially says, if women don't have compulsory monogamy, enforced monogamy or something like that. I, I don't know. No, I don't know. but I've been reading a bit about it and, and I've realised again in the last year that, that these are things that could be lost again. Yeah. And that's why it's important to recognise their importance. Let's dive into the firework displays uh, that you've had on your LBC show. As you mentioned, uh, technology has yeah. helped make you huge because instead of having to be there to listen to your radio programme, things going viral, and yeah. LBC did it very well. They Flip, bundled yeah. these little pieces of you and sent it out yeah. into the world. You know, some of yours have got two million hits, yeah. you know, possibly more. That is, some um, of them are more. Uh, t tell me about the Nigel Farage one that was just super sore away, stratospheric, and how you felt when he came in. What's the atmosphere like at the beginning of an interview like that? Were you... Well, it was a really weird one. Fists up for it right from the word no, go? No, I had a producer called Michael, Michael Keown, who, who is one of those people whose uh, effusiveness and exuberance is infectious. And um, we had nothing in the bag for the show that day. So Farage had been on someone else's show, I think presumably Nick's, Nick Ferrari's, and, and some sort of moron had rung in and said, when are you going to debate James O'Brien? Because he thinks you're a racist and he thinks you can... And, and Farage in his way would have said something like, well, I'd debate him any time he wants or something like that. And, I, and I'd have been not even that interested, to be honest. I was getting worried about what UKIP represented. Alex Andre wrote some stuff for the New Statesman about who they were knocking about within the European Parliament. And, and I thought, this is all a bit iffy, but I, I wouldn't. It's, people talk very comfortably now about fascist... Um, ideologies being back on the march in Europe, people like Steve Bannon telling people to, to embrace accusations of racism and wear them as a badge of honour, that is unrecognisable from, from the pre-Brexit public discourse. So, I, I mean, I thought he was dangerous and ridiculous, but I didn't um, lie awake at night worrying about UKIP. But this thing had happened, and I think possibly I robustly suggested to Michael, my producer, that he needed to come up with some 
content for today's show. <laughs> and I went off to the bathroom. <laughs> and when I came back from the loo, he said, right, Nigel Farage will be in at quarter past 11 for that debate. And I, I, I didn't really fancy it, to be honest with you, because, A, it's incredibly short. No, so Michael had rang him up and, and said, I'm getting quite a lot of emails calling you a coward. <laughs> because you haven't come in and done this debate with James. And, and I, I'm not, still not sure that producers should necessarily overstep the mark in quite this way, because I hadn't wanted it or anything like that. And so I come back from the loo, and I said, well, I don't really want it. Because you've got it. He says, you've got to do it now. He's coming in. So he comes in, and, and I, I just, at that point, thought, well, all this stuff I know about UKIP and, and about him personally, it wasn't capacious research. I've got a very good memory. So most of it was out of private eye or, like I say, Alex's articles in The New Statesman. And I, and I just realised that the man was a, a, a complete charlatan. I mean, everything from, from complaining about people speaking foreign and then conceding that that's actually his wife speaks German to their children. He's, I think he says, I don't think they do it in public. And I said, what are you talking about? And then saying that, that you wouldn't want to live next to Romanians, but it'd be fine living next to Germans. And then I think you know the difference. And then talking to him about the company he'd been chairman of that went, um, that the tax man came after because they, I think they got, ended up with a winding up order. And it was just, I just knew it all. It wasn't, a, it wasn't even planned, as I say. Michael made the booking. And but sort of about five minutes before the end, I don't know if Twitter existed then, or but I started getting... And a, a sense that it had left the building already, even though he was still there. There must have been stuff coming in. Yeah, it was definitely on Twitter. It hit the yeah. wires or, or something. Happened. And people that I don't think knew who I was were talking about this amazing interview on on LBC. And then, of course, his, his ludicrous um, uh, henchman, O'Flynn, who'd been on The Express with me. I hadn't known him at The Express. We came in to drag him out of the studio because it was all going so badly and whatever happened to Nigel Farage eh? so that was the end of him <laughs> how does how does it work being on the same station as him does that cause I, you I, any problems I mean I, it doesn't cause me problems in the sense that it's not as bad as someone else that used to work there um, were you one of the ones who cheered when Katie Hopkins I think I was left? on air when it actually when it actually happened but I would certainly have been cheering inwardly um uh, he's a, look he's an elected politician he represents almost everything I I, I despise um, in terms of uh, humanity and, and what you should judge people by, whether it's their place of birth or their, their ethnicity or their origins or whether it's the contents of their heart and their behaviour and their conduct. Um, but BBC, which is pretty much the only other place I could work at the moment, don't allow anyone to have any opinions at all. And, and the more opinionated I want to be, the more it is inevitable that opinions I find deplorable and toxic also get oxygen and, and, and get air. So I, I'm, I'm sanguine about it. I, I, I'm nostalgic for the days when the most right-wing person I worked with was Nick Ferrari, who's a, who's a mate, <laughs> okay. you know. But, um, but, yeah, but it's is not it a just, tricky one, though? It's your... not just LBC. I mean, he's never off the bloody telly, is yeah. he? So it's, it's, I, I, I resent the idea that we've got... I know we put him in front of the microphone, but it, it's, it's not unique to us no. that he gets far more attention but, than he deserves. But to exactly that point, I mean, is there any culpability uh, on the left under that umbrella of you know, all free speech is necessary, mm. that actually, unless it's really informed yeah. free speech, which I think most people would accept before the referendum vote, the information may have been limited. Yeah. You know, is that enough of an argument to say that you just allow these voices, it doesn't really matter what they're saying, you have to allow them to be heard? Not for me, no, actually. I think we've made a terrible mistake. And, and the, I mean, the election of Donald Trump is almost the apotheosis of the process because it's not it's not freedom of speech, is it? It's, it's freedom of speech without consequences. So what these loonies want is to be able to say things that aren't true without being challenged. It's not, a, it's not, and also, you know, you're free to go to Speaker's Corner and shoot your mouth off, but you don't automatically deserve a season ticket for question time or, or your own radio show. Or the show. validation of uh, precisely a that. salary yeah. and a position. Yeah, I don't do it. I never had Anjem Chowdhury on the programme. Tommy Robinson rang in, or Stephen Yaxley Lennon, to give him his correct name, rang in a, once or twice, but under false names, he didn't know it was him. I, I don't think there is an argument for saying that these people need to be heard. Because if what they're selling is is dangerous and dishonest, there is no gain in calling them dangerous and dishonest. The people that want to hear the lies, the comforting lies, 
will not be persuaded not to. So they, they will always, I think, come out of that studio. I remember sitting in the Alan Titchmarsh. I Good love. Lord, we've made a leap there. Okay. We haven't, oddly, <laughs> because that's where it ended up. Last time I saw Anjem Chowdhury, who considers someone like me to me a much, much bigger problem than um, some of the people who set themselves up as being passionately anti-Islamist. It's, it's people like me who call him out for what he is, point at him and laugh. That's the stuff he hates. The people who treat him like a villain and a really dangerous person, which he became, but if we treated him like an inadequate idiot before he became a dangerous person, then we could have avoided a whole heap of problems. So I'm in the audience, or I'm waiting to go on the Alan Titchmarsh show many moons ago, and Chowdhury's on it, and, and the audience start booing him like like the Phantom Flanflinger from Tiswas. Do you remember? It was, it was, it was a pantomime villain. Do you villain. know what? I'm actually struggling with the notion of the line-up on the Alan Titchmarsh show that Fan- day. I, just, I don't know what he was there for, but he was literally booked to be booed. And I remember thinking at the time, that's why I'm never going to have him on my show, because he's loving it. Mm. He's absolutely loving this. And, and you know... The people he's seeking to persuade that he's right, if he if he if he succeeds with two people, it's mission accomplished for him. So they come away thinking, yeah, the West does hate us, and yet, so I know I don't think extremists do actually. I think they get far too much time on on so-called mainstream media, and unless of course they can justify what it is that they're saying with something other than um, yeah. rhetoric and, and empty hatred. So here's a really big question. Go on. Yep, that you're going to have to answer possibly as a talented radio professional in under two minutes. Yeah. What the heck is going to happen to Britain after Brexit? Just or generally. Stop. I mean, the people's vote. Are you behind that? Yeah, I, you... I am kind of behind it. I, I'm, I mean, I don't put all my eggs in that particular basket. I think it could be devilishly close again. Depends a lot on what the newspapers do, I think, um, because they still set the tone for much of much of the public debate. But I, I, I think we're in a really scary place. And the problem with being a radio presenter is you, you want to tell truth to power, or I do at least. But equally, I don't want all my listeners to switch off because it's so bleak and pessimistic. So the problem I've got at the moment, very recently realised this, is covering the stuff that I think is important without turning into a kind of... A diatribe of yeah, doom. Or, 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 yeah, or, a, you know, I don't, the hell in a handcart school of journalism or, or something like that. But I think three... Th- I mean, Brexit is potentially disastrous. Uh, I can't see any positives to any of the alternatives to remaining. Uh, what Theresa May's embarked upon now is, is a damage limitation to make it as less bad as it can possibly be without ever admitting in public that she thinks it's a disaster. The one admirable thing about her is that she has found it impossible, conscience-wise, to say that she would vote to leave, uh, unlike some of her less principled colleagues who, who now pretend that this is what they wanted all along. So that's going to be a disaster. You look at property prices, there's there's a massive reckoning coming. So you believe Mark Carney's recent? No, not not in regard to doom. Brexit. This is this is this is prong two of the looming fork. Okay, so outside just just generally, even without happen. Brexit, making yeah. everything worse. The the people I speak to now who who don't even dream of owning homes would have already been in them when they were my age. L- Lucy and I bought our place. We got a one hundred and ten percent mortgage for a flat in Labrook Grove, on. She was a graduate trainee, and and I was I'd doing all right, but no, no, nowhere near where you'd need to be now to get a flat in Labrook Grove. And of course, to get it now, you'd need a thirty percent deposit saved up as well, let alone the ability to get a mortgage. So that that, that terrifies me that because that's capitalism. If you haven't got a stake in the society, what keeps me comfortable at night now at forty six and a half is the knowledge that if the wheels came off tomorrow. We could sell the house, downsize, we could probably afford to live without a mortgage somewhere smaller than where we are now. We'd be okay. And when we retire, and so I've got, a, I can see it in front of me. But what if you haven't got a mortgage? What if you haven't got a property and you're working really hard and you're winning and you're playing by the rules and you're succeeding, but you're never going, I mean, who's, who, what happens when you're not working anymore? How do you keep a roof? So there's a massive problem coming and people won't talk about it because you can't blame Muslims, immigrants and single mothers for it. So there's no narrative in the national news yet for this problem down the line. And and the third thing is the is the work, because the the to not just the zero hours contracts and the gig economy and all that sort of thing, but the professional insecurity, the transfer of risk from the investors 
who don't take the risk anymore. The risk is being taken by the workforce, who are getting paid per job rather than a fixed wage. You to imagine getting up on a Monday morning and not knowing how much money you're going to have earned by Friday, with the possibility that you're not going to have earned enough to pay your rent. That's becoming a common experience, for, and it's moving up the socioeconomic ladder from your traditional shelf stackers or warehouse workers. It's getting higher and higher and higher until you've got people who are essentially professionals in creative industries who are frightened to complain about their terms and conditions because they can't really afford to keep the rent going for more than five or six weeks in the event that they stop earning. So I might be catastrophizing, but but those three things make me bloody glad I'm 46 and they make me fear for my children. Mm. As a, you know, clever and engaged man, is there not a bit of you that thinks, you know, these are the problems of my time. Mm. Uh, I shouldn't just be sitting in a radio studio talking about them. I might actually have the means to be some force for good and and kind of practical change. Is that ever tempting? Yes. Yeah, I would have said no a, a year ago. I had a weird experience at the Hay Literary Festival where several people in the audience asked variations on that question and the reaction just in that one room, because a radio studio can be quite a lonely place, of course. It's, um, but I don't, I mean... Two, what, would, what would you do? I mean, do you think you do have something else in you apart from I, I don't know. the chatting? I don't know. I mean, 50 is the next big milestone. I'd, I need to find out whether I've got a novel in me. Um, but, yeah, I, I always thought I'd be a politician. My wife's not keen. Um, Will and she have the final say? I wouldn't do something she was passionately opposed to, no. Um, uh, but but it, I don't like the phrase final say. It sounds a little bit emasculating. For you. <laughs> well... You're the feminist. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, I, I'll tell you what, 2018, 2017, 2018 have been for me. It's been the, there aren't any grown-ups. Not like, in the world? Well, no, in the world, or certainly in this country. I just always presume the story about the railways today, and that, that, that has a phrase in the middle of it, in the middle of the report from the watchdog on why the railways fell to pieces earlier this year, nobody took charge. And that, for me, applies right across the country at the moment. A part, part of it, Theresa May's doing a, whatever it is she's doing with Brexit, but no, nobody's in charge. And there's no sense that the cavalry are just over the hill. So if things are as bad as I worry sometimes, not all the time, if things are as bad as I worry that they are, then, then I guess conscience-wise there comes a point where you can't stay on the sidelines throwing rotten tomatoes. I don't know, otherwise you turn into Richard Littlejohn. <laughs> I wouldn't well, wish that on anyone. Thought. There is you know? a thought. You, you, yeah. I don't know. Maybe you have to roll your sleeves up and try and make things better at some point. Out of all of the people that you have talked to on Unfiltered, mm. and, and you know the reason why I'm here is because, very sadly, this is your last Unfiltered. That, yes, it is my last yeah. Unfiltered. Very sadly. Actually, uh, you've, you, so you've met some extraordinarily you know, bright minds and important people. Uh, who is the person whose company you've enjoyed the most oh, and genuinely left feeling... R r go on. You know, th 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 it's, a, it's great to be alive in the same world as Oh, X. lordy, I can't answer that. No, you've got to do a favourite. I can't pick you one. Gotta, I you can't, I'm not having one, because there isn't one. I mean, they've been completely you different have two, experiences. I'll let you have two, but no more. <sighs> I think Akala made me feel intellectually intimidated for the first time in a long while, and that's a great feeling, and that's, that's encouraging. Um, people like Ben, Drew, Plan B, um, seeing a young man who's, you know, been through a lot, and, and, and comfortable talking about it. That was very uplit. No, I, I, I can mention I haven't had one bad experience. Okay. I, 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 but isn't that interesting that the two people who've risen to the surface fastest are younger than you? So to your point yes. that, you know, approaching 50 can be difficult and you wonder about what you've put in and what's coming next, you know, perhaps we are the generation that has to sit back and go, we don't understand the world that we're living in anymore. You know, it's, it's some, it is actually up to somebody else to, to sort it out. If, if you just reminded me that if I absolutely, if you'd held a gun to my head and said, who did you come out of interviewing feeling most happy, it probably would have been Catelyn Moran, actually, who I hadn't really met before. I met her many, many years ago. A story came out in the interview. Um, and she wrote something this weekend that, that I would have agreed with you last week, but she wrote something about the pressures on young people today and possibly we're not helping when we tell them that 
that they're going to have to sort all this shit out. It's, it's, you know, you've got mental health crises and various other issues yes. unfolding across the country. So yes, it, I, it may be what I believe, but I'm going to resist the temptation to tell them that that's that's what they've got. But yeah, you're right. They are they are both younger than me, and and I mean, but then you know, I did, Lily Allen was a magnificent interview. Eric Cantona was. It's it's one of the things I've done in my life that I'm proudest of. This yeah. podcast, I no, really they have am. been wonderful it's to been listen a, to. An absolute yeah. joy, and and it's it's only. It's only because of various, you know, career pressures that we can't carry on doing it. It's 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 a body of work that I think will stand the test of time. I really do. Who slipped through the net who you would love to have had on but didn't quite get? It's really... Frank Lampard? Uh, well, I'm not, sure Frank, I'm not sure Frank Lampard would have done it. Although, I mean, that's probably due some sort of... Rapprochement. I don't think they asked him. I didn't get that involved in it. The, the, the Rich Cooper, the producer, has done an amazing work over the course of most of a year, um, bringing in people that were both fascinating to me and perfect for the for the genre. I didn't want this to be um, a, a, a combative environment, and it took a bit of realizing. You know, I didn't want to bring in. Jordan Peterson, for example, mm. or we're going to do Piers early. Piers agreed to be the first guest. Piers Morgan. And then schedules intervened, and it and it never quite happened. And I I I I kind of think with even with him probably because he's very outspoken, and we disagree on most subjects. I'd love to have got inside and found out more about him, but I don't know if we could have done that because we're so like rutting stags on issues like Brexit, and 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 I didn't want this to be like that. So that's been really nice. That's been lovely having conversations with people that were calm and measured. So R Ricky Gervais was supposed to do it. I, I, I think he and Steve Coogan, and these are not left field names, but people who I haven't seen sitting down for an hour and being gently encouraged to, to talk about most aspects of their mm. existence because the people that you think you know, Lineker was fascinating. Wasn't he brilliant? Oh, I was so proud of that because, you know, yeah. Gary can pick and choose. He can do whatever he wants. But And he asked, I mean, it wasn't, he didn't have a book out. He didn't have anything to to sell or um, a lot of people haven't and the ones that have, have been wonderful anyway because doing an hour is not like turning up for three minutes at a radio studio or, two, or on the one show and then shuffling off the sofa at the end to make way for James Corden I wouldn't mind doing James Corden there you mm. go so I could go on you could you could have a marvellous yeah, series and then too. Theresa May Somewhere. maybe Jeremy Corbyn I, there's, all, there's all sorts of people but, yep, but no to, 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 yep, top I'm of the list you. probably Ricky Gervais yep. actually I thought the lovely part about Gary Lineker actually was when you were talking to him about uh, you know being trolled mm. and about being hated and he was talking about the new power of the individual that we have on social media but he still referenced the absolute shit your pants fear of knowing that a paper is going to publish something yeah. really cruel about you. And to hear somebody like him, yeah. you know, where you think, actually, there's a guy who's untouchable yeah. now. Yeah. When he talked about it with the proper fear in his voice, you thought, yeah, that is still a thing. So my final question to you is just about that ascending rise into the stratosphere of household name and all of that kind of stuff. With your background in journalism, do you go into that slightly fearful that it can't you, it can't possibly just be the good times that are ahead the bigger you get I don't know I guess so I don't have any skeletons in my closet but they don't have to be skeletons do they the way I mean it, it, I've got young children youngish so I, I talked to you about the circumstances in which I left school um the, 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 there is nothing that would constitute I've never cheated on my wife there's nothing that would constitute a car crash but if they decide that they want to go after me, then, yeah, it, it is a little bit unnerving. The Sun had a proper go earlier this year. I ended up in an op-ed in The Sun. After what about leaving Newsnight with your balanced, unbalanced views? Yeah, that... that I, I mean, again, I can cast myself as a man of immense principle who walked away from a plum job in British broadcasting because he needs to speak truth to power from his other platform. But I was doing one or two news nights a month and I'm on LBC every day. So, if, I mean, it, 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 I could have wind my, wind, wound my neck in on LBC and kept the... the, the, the they won't let a, someone who's perceived as a liberal or perceived as left wing, they won't let them have the same lassitude that they would allow a right winger. You, I mean, Andrew Neil, brilliant journalist, he publishes The Spectator. If you're allowed to present BBC political programmes while publishing The Spectator, then you need to show me the left um, wing 
organ that's yes. also, and I don't think that happens. And the orchestrated complaining that went on over Newsnight was quite incredible. But again, I think that was unique to Brexit. I think because my anti-Brexit stuff was doing so well on LBC, the, the, the pro-Brexit people bombarded, never got a single complaint on Newsnight about anything I'd done on Newsnight. Mm. But poor old Ian, the, the editor, was, was fending off complaints, orchestrated complaints. And you've seen the WhatsApp groups, you know how it works, um, about stuff I was doing on Twitter. Again, complaints about stuff I was doing on Twitter, complaints about monologues on LBC, and, and it just became um, it became a little bit embarrassing, and it wasn't a big enough part of my daily or, or monthly grind to to to, to stay. I mean, yeah. it became quite. So the look at me, Gene, is strong enough and wonderful enough to to see you through, though. Yes, I think so. I mean, it's listen to me more than look at me. And, and I've, 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 you haven't even mentioned, I've written a bloody book, Feed Lover, and you haven't mentioned it once. So it's a final would question. You, would you like to talk For, about your book? No, no, <laughs> just buy it. Just buy it. But, but I really, really, it's only 50 odd thousand words, and, and, and I've really, really enjoyed writing it. It's, it's an intellectual rigour that I haven't really brought to much else that I've done. So, so that, that's been great fun. Um, I don't know what will be next, but like I said, I'd reached a place five or six years ago where if things carried on as they are, I'd have been happy. So if this is it, that's brilliant. That's 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 lovely. Um, and if there is a few more treats and surprises in store, that's lovely too. And if they find anything on me more embarrassing than having once sold suits, then I'll have to. But I, you think after two years of searching for dirt and they've gone for and the third gone. time with who <laughs> used to sell suits, you'd be fairly comfortable that there's not there's yeah. nothing there's nothing on the. I think you're either clean yeah. or you've worked really well. You've got to an amazing bury it. PR people. <laughs> yeah, really good. Well, just personally. I hope that you don't ever cross over to another side. I think I think you are really brilliant at what you do. Thank you. And you just need to stay doing it. And also, just as a listener, it's really annoying when people get successful and they go off and, you know, do other things and change stations. You know, you need to just be there. But it, I mean, but also, you know, I've always quite liked being an outsider. When I was on the Express, the mail offered me a job, but it would have involved stepping down in status and the editor it was the mail on sunday actually it wasn't a daily mail the, the, the editor said something about how that they're the american army and the express are uh, you know um gorillas and you might blow up the old the old bridge but you're never going to win the war or something like that and i remember thinking at the time i didn't i didn't move across I, i'd like blowing up bridges i don't mm. want to i don't want to be a general in the in the main army i want to i'm much happier being the yeah, leader of a little guerrilla band, like a like a Greek um, uh, resistance, yeah, it's Capitan m- Michaelis in the mountains of Crete. More, more fun in the centre of the pack. Yeah, than, and, and, and don't forget, front. I've got I've, you know we've gone from two hundred thousand listeners to, to over a million. So the jobs that you would have said when I started on LBC, oh, you might do that one day, or you might do that one day. They're not now. Eddie Mayer's just come over to LBC from one of the plum. Broadcasting jobs at the BBC, so I, I think we've made a place. Sweetheart, I'm wearing black. <laughs> I saw Everybody, him. He sends his love, actually. I saw him as I left. Everyone at the BBC has been told we must do that for a certain period so, of time. So the status has changed. It's not a job now that that, that looks like a, a stepping stone to something else. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a job in and of oh, itself. Oh, I love you for saying that because I think that has been the curse of our profession for years. Isn't, isn't it? it? You and I are roughly the same age. Mm. I'm a little bit older. But it was always assumed that you went into radio because you wanted to yeah. go into television and become an... Yeah. So people still don't believe you. It's no. all Alan Partridge's <laughs> fault. Let me on the telly. Let me on the Let telly. Them. What do you think your father would think of you <laughs> if he saw you now? Do you, do you think of him when you're broadcasting, actually? You mention him most days. Um, he'd be chuffed. And I think he'd think it had been worth it. And he'd never tell me. <laughs> really? Did he say it in looks? No, he, Did he, you he told feel me a couple it? of times. He, I think he saw me do Question Time. But he never saw me do Newsnight. He hasn't. He obviously didn't see any of the radio stuff going, <laughs> he's all right, he's, I know what you're doing. Is. You want me to start crying and this will be the bit when I do. <sighs> Whenever things were going badly, like that period when I was making a living as a talking head, and then a bit before that, when I was stuck in suit selling and I wanted to be a journalist, and I, I'd console myself with the thought that I was going to write a book. So I'd, that, that would be my way of thinking, well, I'm not going to spend my life measuring inside legs. And I'd say to Dad, and it's a Peter Cook joke, it's not his joke, I'd say to Dad, Dad I'm writing a book. My dad would always go, neither am I, son. Neither am I. So I think 
if I end up in the window of water stones in November with my, with my then that, that then I'll really bloody miss him. Mm. But that should be book number maybe three by the <laughs> by now it should, yes. No, no, but but neither am I. That should be the title. <laughs> well, that, that could be, be a good one for the, for a memoir. Neither am I, son. Neither am I. Well, I bloody have. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Exactly. Well, it's been lovely to be here. Thank you very much thank indeed for, for allowing me my fan girl hour. That's it, isn't no, it? No, thank you. It? it is, and the final unfiltered. <laughs> Hello, I'm James O'Brien. Thank you for watching this episode of Unfiltered. Not only is there plenty more where that came from, but there's plenty more to come as well. So make sure you subscribe to Unfiltered and put yourself at the front of the queue for all forthcoming interviews.